I've done the PIBS thing before, and there's always been lots of lively uh, discussion at the end. So hopefully we can get through a lot of this stuff and get right to the lively discussion part. Um, I, I don't know what, what you guys know about how the University of Michigan Research Enterprise is structured, but I'm Elaine Brock. Um, everything that comes through the university that funds research comes through uh, an organization called the Division of Research Development and Administration. And I'm the, essentially the director of that organization. So that's why I get into these things, because there's a lot of stuff that has to do with outside sponsorship. But when we're talking about conflict of interest generally, which is the topic for today, um, in, order for, in order for faculty to, or, or anybody actually, to want to comply with conflict of interest kinds of guidelines, you have to sort of start with a presumption that says that if you make a disclosure and if you have a conflict of interest, it's not a bad thing. It's actually something that we're, that we're interested in having faculty do. So um, throughout this little presentation, you're going to see these little um, quotes on the bottom. Um, the qu so that if you're completely bored with the presentation, you may still enjoy the quotes. And some of them, in my perverse way of thinking, have something to do with the topic that's actually on the slide. So as we go along, um, hopefully you'll like some of these quotes as well. But anyway, we care about conflicts because of these kinds of things about influence and undue influence and biasing and all those kinds of things that, are, that have bad connotations. So those are the potential negative results of conflicts of interest, even if you assume that a conflict of interest itself is not a negative thing. So the basis for conflict of interest management has nothing really to do with the conflict itself. It has to do with the outcomes of the conflict. So uh, the interests of the institution in um, regulating conflict have to do with promoting scientific integrity and preserving public trust and all the kind of good things that ivory tower institutions like the University of Michigan are supposed to project for the benefit of the public. So he, lately, there's disclosure requirements about financial conflicts of interest sort of everywhere. So people are being inundated with these obligations to disclose. And there are, being, uh, there are, there are disclosures in, of outside activity for med school purposes. There's disclosures of technology, uh, on technology transfer agreements and um, uh, proposal approval kinds of forms for outside sponsorship. Um, and then there's also ones that relate to a particular activity that uses animals or people. Um, and then there's some that relate to the particular kind of organization that you're dealing with, like NIH or FDA. Um, and then there's also ones that deal with professional outcomes, like uh, disclosures to journal editors. <clears throat> this is an artifact of the distinction between transferring a Mac PowerPoint to a PC PowerPoint. So that is actually... You, I think that it might have translated on the overheads, though. So th that's actually the logo of the National Institutes of Health, for those of you who, are, who can't picture that up there. Um, and what this is is the basic policy from 1995 uh, for the National Institutes of Health. It actually has also been picked up by the National Science Foundation. And it's, a, it's essentially a very broad statement, assuming a lot of knowledge on behalf of the person who's making the disclosure, and essentially saying, um, that they are interested in having disclosures where investigators might appear to have outcomes of their research affected by these other relationships that they have. So um, AAU, several years after that, in 2001, uh, picked up this, this um, notion that universities really ought to have conflict of interest policies of some kind. But they didn't really have a lot to say about what the conflict of interest policy should say. So they basically just said, universities, you go out there and do the right thing. And so that was the genesis of a lot of universities um, scurrying around to get uh, conflict of interest policies and disclosure policies in place. Um, shortly after that, the, American Associa the Association of American Medical Colleges created a personal financial conflict of interest policy and made a recommendation that institutional policies should create rebu ir uh, rebuttable presumptions that individuals who hold significant financial interests in research um, involving human subjects could not conduct that research. So this was an interesting discussion. The University of Michigan uh, representatives attended this conference and actually were on the other end of this spectrum, saying essentially, we understand conflict of interest is essential to the proper management and functioning of a large research university. We encourage conflicts of interest. And we believe that if our faculty do the right things and we know what these conflicts are, we can attempt to manage conflicts rather than prohibit them. So the University of Michigan it doesn't, necess doesn't necessarily follow this rebuttable presumption. We do have a university-wide conflict of interest definition, and you'll see again that it involves all those things we talked about earlier on the public trust side, so the judgment and the biasing and the influence and the gain and the advancement. So those are all the common things, that common themes that keep recurring in conflict of interest. 
So given all this hype and all this regulation and all these people asking for disclosures all over the place, why doesn't the, a place like the University of Michigan just say, you can't have these situations, you can't be involved in things that create the potential for conflict of interest? Well, it's because to a very large degree, the university is a corporation. We are mercenary. We need money. So um, if we create this entrepreneurial activity and we foster these relationships, these relationships will lead to good things for the institution. So they'll increase our research support from industry. Uh, they'll allow our faculty to consult, um, so increase their salaries. They'll promote opportunities for um, relevance of information in the, t in the teaching settings. Um, they provide opportunities for student placements. They provide leverage opportunities for donations and that kind of thing. So there's all this good stuff that happens from these potential relationships that faculty and the university can have with these outside entities. So in an actually very forward-thinking move from a relatively glacially, slowly moving university like Michigan, in 1996, the Regents um, said that they believed tech transfer to be part of the mission of the institution. And tech transfer necessarily, almost, involves outside organizations and involves people furthering research and development of new ideas that generate in labs or generate from federal funding. So what the regents wanted to do is make sure that if someone had, was successful in that they had a good idea or a good invention, um, they weren't cut off from furthering developing that in the university. And instead, the regents defaulted to proper management of these external relationships and the further development of, their, of people's own technology in the institutional setting by looking to the conflict of interest processes to put proper management of conflicts of interest in place to allow this further development to go on. So this was all the way back in 1996. When we look at conflicts of interest, we can look at them from different types. And some of them we manage and some of them are assumed to be managed or assumed to be completely ignored. So the ones that are managed are the financial ones, whether they're in, and most of the time personal financial ones. These non-financial professional kinds of conflicts that you guys are probably all very familiar with, so your mentors using, um, using your name on publications or having you do work or whatever, um, and the tenure policies and the tenure system and all the kinds of things that people do to get promoted. Obviously those are serving their own, people serve their own interests when they're doing those kinds of things. But non-financial and professional conflicts of interest are not managed the same way um, that financial um, conflicts of interest are. And the bias and the, and the um, kinds of lack of public trust that may ensue from the tenure system is not of the same kind of nature that a financial conflict of interest is. So universities sort of assume that the system itself manages those kinds of things through ombudspeople and uh, misconduct policies and things like that. Um, of, of recent uh, vintage in um, regulation is institutional conflicts of interest. So where the university itself is involved in a transaction, we own stock in startup companies, um, or we uh, facilitate access to university facilities for companies that are further developing our own technologies, or we have people placed in the university in decision-making roles who have financial, personal interests in some of these organizations. So those we are going to talk about a little bit. So the scope, when I'm talking about the scope of financial conflict of interest, most of these disclosure policies, uh, it would be just too easy if they only related to the person making the disclosure. So most of them relate to other people as well. So in this definition of who's included in the others, whether it's the spouses or it's dependent children, um, uh, this is the University of Tennessee's policy, and I, it's kind of interesting because it's pretty extensive, I mean, including step and foster children. <coughs> Um, whether or not they're adopted, apparently, as long as they're dependent. Um, and then, like the University of Michigan talks about significant business associates, for instance. But when you're looking at conflict of interest disclosures, you have to read the fine print about what they're actually actu asking you to disclose, because they may be asking you to disclose on behalf of yourself, plus any of these other people who are, who, who are defined in whatever policy you're trying to comply with. So what are the kind of, kind of common situations that require disclosure? And they're, they're really a handful of them when you get right down to it. So the simultaneous relationships, so a simultaneous consulting relationship um, with an organization that's sponsoring your research, for instance. So you owe a duty to, the, to a company who's paying you to perform certain services, and then in addition, you're working in a closely related area inside of your employment setting, which is a common thing because most people who are microbiologists don't consult in English literature. So people tend to consult in the area in which they're an expert. So these, these simultaneous relationships um, actually are part of the good thing that we mentioned before, since about 80% of the industry-sponsored research that comes into an institution like Michigan comes in because people have personal relationships with the company that's sponsoring the research. 
When we get a little deeper into these, not just a consultant, but these management roles or equity holdings, then the allegiance that a person owes to the company gets deeper. So a management role uh, presumes a, a fiduciary relationship of some kind. And equity relates to the whole of the company rather than just a particular technology or particular set of services. Um, you can be, there can be um, situations in which there is an inventor um, who has an ownership interest in a technology that's the subject of the research. If that research is being sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, that's probably not a disclosable financial conflict of interest. But if it's being sponsored by Pfizer, and Pfizer's the licensee who's supposed to be developing that technology, it probably is disclosable. Then you can just go on and on. These, and most of these involve dual relationships of some kind, dual supervisory roles. So an investigator who has a startup company is also um, the employer of the students that he's mentoring in his sponsored project, is also employing them in his startup company of the same students. You look for these kind of up and down uh, imbalances of power relationships in these, in these kinds of things. So when we, um, when we identify these things through self-reporting, uh, that's on the kind of systems that I talked about earlier, all those disclosure kinds of requirements. But there's a lot of other ways to identify conflicts of interest, and some of those aren't as, and aren't as um, uh, prospectively charming uh, to the administrator as the self-identification ones are. So if we get identify, identification of a conflict of interest because an auditor picked it up, um, or, an or someone who's investigating a report of, um, of some sort of misconduct, or somebody from the Wall Street Journal calls and asks us about those kinds of things. Uh, <clears throat> those are the situations in which the university hopes that we had the disclosures in place that support um, those, kinds of re those kinds of audits and reviews. So one of the ways that we do that is on a proposal approval form. So this would be a, a situationally based disclosure. So someone wants to do research for a company that they are also consulting with, for instance. They would disclose that conflict of interest on the, um, on the proposal approval form, which is the internal routing document for sponsored projects inside the University of Michigan. Most institutions have a document simpler, similar to that. Um, and the, it's the principal investigator who's disclosing um, that not only themselves, but any other key participants don't have a, um, a financial interest to disclose. So the medical school is uh, double looking at that, um, as, ma as many schools do, by prospectively asking for disclosure of outside activities. So then they can look at the disclosure of outside activity reports from the various faculty members and staff members, and then they can all and cross-reference that to the disclosure that's on a proposal approval form or a technology transfer disclosure or something like that, so that they can see if someone says they have a conflict of interest, what that conflict of interest is. So, so the, um, not all of these outside activities that are disclosed um, to the medical school, for instance, or to the department chair, involve conflicts of interest. Since someone be, could be consulting for a company that has absolutely nothing to do with the, re, with the research that they're doing, necessary, except from a discipline standpoint. In addition to that, um, people are required to disclose to certain kinds of sponsors, like the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, um, and those actually say that the signature of the authorized institutional signer um, confirms that the institution has these various policies and procedures in place. So um, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting problem to um, try to get enough education to people who are involved in sponsored projects out there so that the people like me who are making these certifications on behalf of the institution can do that with some reasonable degree of certainty that these, all, all these disclosures are in place. In addition, like the kinds of conflicts of interest that, we talked, that I talked about earlier about tenure and those kinds of conflicts, there are other kinds of sort of large, unregulated conflicts of interest. And it's, it's certainly true that companies um, have an unregulated conflict of interest. So if, if we're uh, pharmaceutical companies. So they're looking to FDA to, um, to, ga to gain permission to, um, for the drug or device that they're trying to put on the market. So you could see where a company might want to bias the data that they have author that they've paid to produce or that they haven't paid to produce, um, so that they could get a more favorable outcome from the f from FDA on an approval of a drug or device. That particular conflict is not regulated. So the FDA presumes that the companies who are coming to them to secure their permission to move these drugs and devices through the regulatory processes and into the marketplace are interested financially in the outcome of those trials. But they do go bad, but FDA does step back a bit and says that uh, the sponsor, which is usually the pharmaceutical company, although in some cases it may not be, that's a different class, um, 
it, sa it asks the sponsor to certify that the value of any compensation, compensation that they're paying to any investigator who's performing um, any of part of the clinical trial in which data is being gathered is not affected by the outcome of the study. So this is a very different standard than the standard that we were looking at for the university who's looking at whether the conflict of interest, so say someone has a $10,000 consulting agreement, whether that $10,000 consulting agreement is of sufficient magnitude for the investigator to choose to or to inadvertently bias the results of their research in favor of the company who's paying them the $10,000 where this, this standard is, says that all the company has to say is that I'm going to give the person $10,000 regardless of what the outcome is. So they don't, so it's, if, they, if they just say we're, that the value of what's being paid isn't being, isn't being determined based on the outcome of the study, it's a different, it's, it's a different concept. So it's a pretty low standard, I think, for pharmaceutical companies to have to meet to say that, the, that I'm paying someone $10,000 flat. I'm not giving them 10010 if the outcome happens to be positive. So all they have to do is have fixed price consulting agreements, essentially, to meet this standard. So in conflict of interest reviewers, and there are two committees at the University of Michigan. There's one for the medical school, which was founded in about 1993, and then there's another one for everybody else. And those committees um, look at these disclosure situations, and they, they tend to look at them on a transaction-based system. So they're not looking at every one of those outside employment disclosures that come through the medical school, unless the person has indicated on the disclosure that that outside employment also constitutes a conflict of interest of some kind. So the conflict of interest reviewers are assessing these situations and they're trying to define the relationships. So this person is a consultant for this company and they're the principal investigator on this project and they're also the brother-in-law of the person who owns the company and they have two students who are working with, for their company who are also their, to, for whom they're also their academic advisor. So once you map all of that out, then the conflict of interest committee can try to assess whether there's any risks like the, the type that we talked about, public trust, bias, those kinds of things, and whether they need, what kinds of plans they need to put in place to pr protect against the, that bias. And for conflict of interest committees to be relatively successful, they have to be sort of prospective in that people need to know ahead of time um, what's going to be allowable. So they do use a precedent kind of setting where they look at similar situations from similar projects under similar disclosures and try to uh, choose similar kinds of management strategies. So there's the predictability part. In addition, there's, the, there's places like the IRB and the IACUC, so the Animal and Human Review Committees for, for the university. And those places also require conflict of interest. Those committees also require conflict of interest disclosures. Most institutions haven't answered the, the question about which committee trumps which other committee. But I view it as sort of a you have to have the three apples line up across the slot machine before you can get the payout. So if you have animals and humans and a conflict of interest, you have to have yeses from all of those three committees in order to move forward. That's essentially how it works. So none of them really trump each other. But if any one of them wanted to stop an activity and, that, and the activity involved all those things, it, they could. So these management plans protect sort of the basic values concepts. So they protect the university against the risks proposed by these activities. And these are the, all, all the apple pie and motherhood kinds of things. Objectivity of research, timely publication, public disclosure, um, the ability to fulfill your obligations to your colleagues and your students and your subjects. Um, the integrity of academic decision making so that uh, people who are in decision making positions are doing that with unbiased, in an unbiased way. So some of those ma the management strategies that fulfill those obligations to protect those um, basic values are, are um, listed in actually NIH and NISF early policies but haven't changed tremendously over the last 10 years. So the disclosure of financial interests to whoever needs to know. Uh, the monitoring uh, and the verification of results. So, for instance, uh, conflicts of interest committee are likely to be less concerned about multi-site clinical trials than they are about single-site clinical trials because if, if, you're, if you're in a multi-site trial and you're biasing your data, it should be obvious from comparisons to the other site's data, that kind of thing. There could be disqualifications from participations in certain parts of the research like consenting subjects. Uh, there could be a required divestiture or require severance of whatever the relationship is, like you can't consult during the period that you're conducting that clinical trial, but you can consult before and after the clinical trial is over. Uh, there could be periodic reporting to committees like, review, like conflict of interest review and oversight committees. And then there's always the light of public disclosure, so public access to data, data materials and publications that result from these projects. 
So the key to conflict of interest is to get as few of these overlapping circle squares and ovals as possible. So if you think about consulting, for instance, and as I said before, most people who are biochemists are not going to consult in English literature. So if they, if they do happen to be as talented as to be able to do that, you would have consulting situation C from a scientific standpoint in that the scope of employment invo involves biochemistry, teaching research, service in biochemistry, but their outside interests and their consulting relationships are all in English literature. So there's not much risk that they're going to be biasing anything that they're doing inside the university based on their outside consulting relationship. You can similarly get to consulting C by looking at the scope of the activities that faculty and other people inside the university are asked to, to perform. So faculty do, as I said, teaching, um, research, service, uh, patient care possibly. So if, if you are, also, are being paid by an outside company to look at uh, business plans or to raise money or whatever, um, those activities are not within the scope of employment that the university is paying, paying for. So you could get to consulting C through, even if you're working in the same discipline for a company who's working in a similar area to your basic scientific um, capabilities and research area, you could still be in consulting C based on the activities that you're conducting. So if you look at that then from the, from the overlapping standpoint, the more of these squares and circles and ovals that overlap, the more complex the management plan is going to have to be in order for the university to be satisfied that none of the bias and all that is going to be prompted by having any of these relationships in place. <coughs> so disclosure really is the least common denominator. Um, for, the, for basic management strategies, but then the conflict of interest committees look at who needs to know what they need to know and when they need to know it. And some of that's determined not by policies and regulations, by, but by ethics and norms. So the placement of where those boundaries of acceptability are depend on your point of view. So the conflicted person might think that they would never bias their research. So there would be no reason to have conflict of interest management at all because uh, scientists of high integrity would not bias their research and produce um, illegitimate results. There's a whole body of literature out there that's emerging now that's, that keeps uh, showing up at, at these large conflict of interest conferences that talks about um, the sort of the subliminal bias kinds of things. So faculty members who are a actually of high integrity who would be, who would be appalled to think that, they, that someone would think that they bias their research uh, might in fact be doing that subliminally because they don't understand the effect of the actual, of the actual, the power of the actual um, $10,000 consulting agreement and how it's playing on the, under, on the underlings of their mind while they're doing, while they're conducting these research projects. So, I don't know, I, I personally find that literature kind of annoying in this context because I really do believe that faculty want to do the right thing and they really do, um, it, they would be appalled to think that someone thought that their research was biased. But you can also look at this from the standpoint of colleagues um, supervisors and also from students, you know, whether students feel that faculty are, are appropriately using institutional facilities and appropriately conducting research and appropriately mentoring them and all that in a way which is in their best interest and the institution's best interest versus the best interest of the agency or the organization to which they um, owe some other allegiance as a consultant or an owner or whatever. So moving off of, um, of financial conflicts of interest that are individual is a close hop into institutional conflicts of interest. So institutional financial conflict of interest is of more relative, more recent vintage in terms of regulation nationally than personal financial conflict of interest. But it's, but it's sort of catching up and it has some very significant problems in that most conflict, institutional conflict of interest policies or rec recommendations or guidelines talk about things called senior managers and they talk about external relationships or financial interests of, uh, in faculty projects of these senior managers or, the, or officials or, or transactions of the institution themselves. So we monitor institutional conflicts of interest for the same reasons that we monitor, that we monitor fi individual financial conflicts of interest. So these, the, these concepts of um, proper allocation and bias and inappropriate decision making and all those public trust kinds of things. So the public not only trusts that the results of the research that we conduct here and the education and all that we, that we do are unbiased, but that also the, uh, the decisions that we make and the investments that we make are made in the best interest of the public because this is a state university. So AAMC talks uh, again about uh, the welfare of human subjects and um, says that, <clears throat> that the interests of the human subjects should not be compromised by competing institutional financial interests, but they don't give us a lot of guidance on what that says. So they're looking at these risks, the biasing research, the diversion of the university from, its, from this, the altruistic and, and uh, nonprofit missions that universities have, 
uh, the loss of decision-making integrity by senior management, and then also preferential treatment so that the university might give sweetheart deals to companies that it has an interest in and give less good terms to companies who are equally deserving but to whom the university hasn't, hasn't invested. So the consequences of failure to protect against those risks are, all, are basically the loss of public trust and the damage to reputation and all the kinds of consequences that come from that. So the bad things that happen to the university's reputation and consequently the economic losses that come from not having a good, uh, a good reputation. But when we're talking about institutional financial conflict of interest, we can be talking about direct conflicts. So <clears throat> when the university licenses technology to startup companies that we create, we often take an equity interest in those companies. So then when we do business with those companies as sponsors or when the company sells us things because they're a vendor or whatever, um, the university actually has a, 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 as if it were a person, has a personal financial interest in the welfare and the well-being of that company because it has stock. So it wants the companies to do well. Um, additionally, there's this concept of senior manager. So when a senior manager has an official relationship within the organization, so they have some sort of decision-making capability or responsibility inside the institution, and they have a significant financial conflict of interest, their financial conflicts of interest are essentially imputed to the institution for purposes of institu management of institutional conflict of interest. So if the chair of a department own stock in a company and the company is the company wants to conduct research in that department then it's the responsibility of the chair to make sure that that transaction is being conducted at arm's length that he's not coercing uh, junior faculty or students to participate in those projects because um, he wants to see his stock do well in the marketplace so the kinds of situations and transactions that we're watching from an institutional standpoint have a lot to do with those kinds of benefits to the institution. So major gifts from commercial companies in exchange for influence and favors, some would call those kickbacks. Uh, financial interests that are acquired by the university in connection with licensing and university technology transfer kinds of deals, the things I talked about earlier about equity, equity for instance. Uh, if the university has master agreements with companies and we give them preferred terms because they tell us that if we give them preferred terms on, this, on research projects, they will give us $60 million in, a, in the gift fund or whatever. Um, and then research involving human subjects or technologies in which the university has an interest. So we do have drugs, for instance, and devices that have originated at the University of Michigan as inventions that are now in the marketplace. So when we're prescribing those drugs to our own, to University of Michigan health system uh, patients, are we required to make a disclosure that the university makes money every time we sell that drug or sell that device, even if we're selling it to our own patient? <coughs> So, and then there's some really obvious ones like the procurement of goods and services. So uh, the university wants to make the best deals it can based on the goods and services that it actually needs and are appropriate uh, for whatever purpose it needs them for, as opposed to simply buying them from the company that's run by the uh, brother-in-law, the vice president for finance. Uh, this, this concept of the university participation in economic development and venture capital funds is a growing concern. Uh, to a large extent because, the, because universities are being compelled to be um, engines for political and economic change in settings, particularly at places like Michigan where the economy is depressed and um, the university is seen as an agent for that kind of the, the capability to produce more economic development. So then last but not least, the role of trustees and officers that allow, um, inadvertently allow the knowledge of university technologies or activities to provide financial advantages to companies without doing that through some sort of a legitimate relationship. So part of the problem with institutional conflict, as I mentioned, is, is how you're defining the institution or the senior manager and whether you're defining that as, an, as the officers, the regents, the directors, and how far down um, the administrative chain you need to go before you get to a point where you're no longer imputing personal financial conflicts of interest by decision makers to institutions. So this, is, this has actually been a source of, of concern for institutions and how far down you have, to, you have to do this in order to, how far down an administrative and decision making chain you have to continue to manage personal financial interests also as institutional financial interests. So over the number of years that I've been playing around with conflict of interest, I've decided that there are basically four types of people. Uh, there are the knowledgeable compliers, so the people who understand conflict of interest very well and they understand what to do about disclosures and how to protect themselves when, they're have, uh, when they have management, conflict of interest management plans in place. So those are, that's where you're trying to get, that everybody understands intuitively conflict of interest and, and complies with all the rules. Then you have the people who 
don't comply with the rules because they're not sufficiently well informed about what the rules are. So those are the educational challenge and probably the reason that I'm here today is to try to um, raise that level of awareness about conflict of interest and conflict of interest disclosures. So, and then you have the record keeping challenge. So those are the people who, even if you tell them about conflict of interest and what it's all about and bias and avoiding it, they don't quite understand it. It never cr quite clicks because they're so convinced that they would never um, have one of these negative outcomes from any relationship that they have that they can't envision um, having to fulfill all of these disclosure requirements to guard against that. But if you tell them what to do, they will do it. So you put the disclosures in front of them and they will disclose. So those are the record, keeper, re record keeping challenges. And then you have the people that you read about in the Wall Street Journal where um, they understand conflict of interest completely and they refuse to comply um, and sometimes bad things happen. And the press is notorious for picking up the incidental bad thing that happens. So you don't read a lot of about uh, people, about the knowledgeable compliers in the Wall front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, so it's eight years later, we're still talking about Jesse Gelsinger. So it's important to keep in mind that management of conflict of interest assumes ethical behavior. So uh, a failure to act ethically due to a conflict of interest is misconduct, as are most other kinds of failures to comply with universities' policies and procedures. We're gonna, we ha I have a series of sort of little cases. Do you want to, um, does anybody have any questions or do you want to sort of run through these? Okay, we'll run through. Um, these are all sort of ripped from the headlines, kind of, so the, the names have been changed to protect the, the um, innocent, but, <clears throat> but these are actual really cases. So I'll let you read them for a second. So on the first question, um, how many of you think that the university should make an attempt to try to manage these outside interests relative to this study? Just hands. Okay, so a lot of you think that she shouldn't be allowed to do this at all. Um, is, is the, is, if there aren't students and if this wasn't clinical research, would, your, would your, more hands go up? So if this was not clinical research, so this was, this was basic drug development kinds of stuff or animal research. How many hands would go up then? Yeah, so it's interesting to see that, in fact, the University of Michigan probably would allow this. We do a lot of management of it. Um, so whether she would allow to be the PI on the study, maybe, um, maybe not. It would depend on, how, on her expertise, whether she's uniquely qualified. It would depend on whether there's multiple sites involved in this study. Um, and, and it would depend um, to some degree on, frankly, on the, the size of the study, the importance of the study for the institution. So it's not necessarily the case that we wouldn't allow her to do this. So the rebuttable presumption that would be that AAMC would insist on here would not necessarily be followed by the University of Michigan because the rebutting would, be, would have to do with the factors that I mentioned. So it does make a difference if there's students on a project. Um, the university will attempt to appoint people in ombudsperson positions for students who are, who are appointed and working on, confl on projects that involve conflicts of interest. They, the university will require disclosures um, by the conflicted people to the students so that the students have the ability to make an informed decision about whether they're interested in participating or not. Um, so there are, and most, if there's any chance that like students' dissertations would not be able to be published because of the conflicts of interest, uh, that would be that would uh, probably be one of those situations where particular aspects of the study couldn't be conducted by particular people. So students wouldn't be able to participate in the parts of the study that would impede their um, academic progress. Um, it does make a difference if it's clinical research. 
it's possible that there would not be, that um, even if Dr. Scientist was able to do this, that she would not be the one to be able to conduct the um, informed consents of these subjects. And even if she did, there might be, uh, they might be being taped or might be, uh, the, the subjects might be referred to another ombudsperson who, would, who they would be able to talk to about whether it was a good idea to participate in this study or not. So all of, the, all of these things happen in the course of the Conflicts of Interest Committees looking at these, um, these projects on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, um, as I mentioned before, there's a high, higher level of management control for institutions if someone owns stock as opposed to simply owning, having cash in, uh, in, uh, that's, that comes to them from a consulting relationship. Question? Yeah, well, I was wondering <laughs> Yes. Yes. So this this project is being conducted by her in within the scope of her employment. So the university's intellectual property policies will kick in, which will say that the university would own intellectual property coming out of this. Now, be, because she has a consulting relationship, though, um, anybody who's seen a consulting um, agreement knows that the consulting, uh, the intellectual property terms on a consulting agreement are almost always overbroad um, and and um, more comprehensive than the scope of the services. So consulting agreements have notoriously large uh, grasps of intellectual property and confidential information on behalf of the company. So unless she has, a very, cl has very clearly defined what her consulting obligations are to the company, such as she serves on the Speaker's Bureau and lectures about some other drug than the one that she's doing this research on, for instance, it'll be hard for her if there's an ultimately, ultimately an invention uh, to decide whether she did that as a consultant or she did that as an employee. So that's part of the things, that's the reason that people like me have law degrees and try to sort this stuff out. But that's, that is a, that's a concern. Okay, so moving on from cardiology to psychology. So this might be a little obscure, but, the re but basically what, what happened was um, that, the, that, the, the PH, that the psychologist was asked to do assessments on a whole series of employees for this company because the company had had uh, recurring instances of what they believed to be um, chemical-borne effects, uh, neurobehavioral chemical-borne effects. So uh, they came to the University of Michigan. So Dr. Sleepy, within his, within, um, his employment capacity, um, was doing these neurobehavioral assessments. And he did a whole slew of them. He did 50 workers over the course of two years. Um, and what he, what he showed from doing those assessments was that there wasn't an effect, didn't believe that there, that there was an effect. Um, Western Minds was sued by the union that represented the employees, um, and Dr. Sleepy uh, represented as an expert for Dr. Minds in the trials. So years later then, he wants to go back in and actually look uh, more specifically at that data, actually was looking at that data in comparison to, uh, to uh, subjects from other kinds of um, uh, work settings. So, so the question then is, can he do that? Can he go back now and look at, um, uh, at the data as, as, as if he hadn't seen the subjects in the first place? Um, and is this a conflict of interest? Is it? Hands? <laughs> Bob says yes. <laughs> it is. And is it, is it a conflict of interest because he, want, because he knows the, essentially knows the results and wants to do the study now on the de-identified data, or because he, had, because he was an expert witness? How, how many think it's because he was an expert witness? What, what, if he was, what if he was subpoenaed as a witness as opposed to being paid by, by um, Western Minds? 
Would that make a difference? Could he then just do what he wanted to do anyway? So, so you still think no? <laughs> huh. Well, it is an interesting thing because at the point that he's doing the study, he has no disclosable financial conflict of interest. He's no longer an expert. He's not a consultant. He has no interest in Western mines. The data is de-identified. He has no personal relationship with these subjects. And he has no particular biased interest in the outcome of this study. So this would be a situation where the university wouldn't regulate this at all. We wouldn't even know about it. There would be no financial, no disclosure requirement at all. If he was continued to, continuing to be an expert, so he was by contract an expert witness for Western Mines at the point that he was doing the second analysis on the de-identified data, then the university would know about that, and we might or might not look at, look at it, because he still, again, doesn't have any, um, there's no necessarily bias, because the outcomes are already there. The study, res the results um, of, these sur of these assessments are already there. So this is, a, this, is a, this is complex because it involves a lot, of, a lot of kind of the ethics and norms things that we were talking about um, and the fact that it got very inflamed uh, when, it, when the subjects, we had actually one of the things that happened is several of the subjects came forward and said they wanted their, as they can, under HIPAA, because remember this is, these are psychological assessments in the health system, so this is HIPAA data. Um, they wanted their data withdrawn from the database. And, but at the point that they wanted it withdrawn, the data had already be, been de-identified in the database. So the university paid some of our own statistic, statisticians to do a model to remove what would amount to the statistical representation of the couple of people who wanted their data removed. Um, and this, this actually, this case was all over um, the newspapers for a long, long time uh, because of the dis because the workers ultimately, because the data didn't show that there was a negative effect, lost the workers' comp benefit from this, from um, this, for these, based on these assessments. So it was, it was sensitive, but it's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily have any conflicts of interest involved in it. Yeah, Jonathan. Mm -mm. Data not the specific. They looked at the, they looked at the statistical, essentially the statistical, the, the, the power calculations with those cases in versus the power calculations with them out, and they removed a, what, they, what amounted to a statistical sample that would have been relatively equivalent to the difference in the power calculation. So they, it's, it's a kind of a weird thing to do. It actually is one of the ways, you probably know, you can de-identify data using statistical methodologies. So that's essentially what they did. You mean no, we de-identified them. Yes. Well, we couldn't. So we just, re so there were like five people who wanted data removed. So we looked at, well, what, if we removed five people, how do we, which five people, you know, so is it whatever the random sample was or how that sample was drawn to, to statistically represent those five people. So what, we don't know whether we remove those five people or not. We removed five cases. So this is one of these institutional conflicts relative to gifts. So this, this $25 million unrestricted gift, which, is a, which would be a very nice thing for most departments, um, go, it goes into this, into this unit. And then the, the chair um, may or may not have any personal relationship with, uh, with the company who gave the gift. But um, does, is there a personal or institutional conflict there then? Probably neither, because despite the fact that part of the chair's obligation is to keep the department well funded, if the chair has no personal relationship with with um, MergeCo, um, then there's no financial personal financial conflict of interest to be imputed to the institution based on the senior management status of the chair. Um, and there's the institution itself has no interest in MergeCo. It doesn't we don't owe stock in it or anything else. So this 25 million, so this is bad practice on behalf of a chair, um, and it does have a lot to do with academic freedom and the mentoring of your faculty, um, and whether or not, how, how much you're willing to prostitute your faculty to achieve an outcome that, that means the financial security of your department. 
But this actually doesn't have anything to do with conflicts of interest. So this is the kind, this is part of the unregulated massive conflicts of interest that we that we talked about in the very, one of the very earliest slides. So you can see where this stuff gets a little hairy if you actually try to ask the right questions and manage this. So it's it's actually two o'clock on that clock. It's almost two o'clock on this clock. So we'll go to the next one. But if people are, want to follow that clock and have to leave, I'll understand. So this is a situation where, in order to be able to conduct the project, the, the financial interest of the investigator um, has to be accounted for in some way. Because the only way to conduct the project is to use the instrument. And the only place to get the instrument is through, um, is through the big, pub big publisher who owns the copyright to it. So how does the institution do that then? And how, what do we have to tell whoever we're doing it for? So suppose she has training centers in five different institutions around the country who, are, who, are going to now, who she's now going to, with a grant from NIMH, train to conduct the assessments using her own instrument. So how does she do that? What does she have to tell them? So that's part of what's in the manage, uh, what would be in a management plan for this kind of a conflict. Um, it did so happen that this was the only instrument available for this particular kind of assessment. So it wasn't like she could um, uh, resubmit her proposal to the institute using an instrument from, from a researcher at a different institution, for instance. Hers is the best, the only instrument out there to do this. So, one, so the way the institution managed this was to require that the royalties, um, that all the royalties that Dr. Good received uh, during the time that these projects were being funded uh, be placed in escrow and then ultimately donated to a nonprofit cause. So, um, so essentially, she couldn't, she couldn't get the copyright back because the publisher was already out there publishing the instrument. Um, but, she could get, but what we could take back was sever her relationship with the money, essentially. So, so that's essentially what happened, is the institution said, you can do this, but you can't make any money on it while you're doing it. Yep? <laughs> Well, it's an interest. This is this is a case where there were students involved. There was when Dr. Good was at um, her previous institution. The students wrote the instrument, um, and this, at the point at the point that they wrote the instrument, they were being paid as graduate students. So the institution um, claimed the copyright and then reassigned it to Dr. Good and the other copyright holders, which was the students. So the students then followed her from, from her previous institution to the University of Michigan. So at the point that they were involved in this continuing research um, and continuing development and continuing training on this, they were also surrendering their royalties that they, that they would have gotten as copyright holders on this. So students are often involved because they, have, they, they are involved in the conduct of the research itself um, or they're involved in these dual relationships as students, students who want to have a relationship with an up-and-coming company, for instance, might want to go work for the, for the faculty member's company on the outside. Um, sometimes company, the relationship is serial, so, fa so students work as GSRAs on sort of basic projects inside the institution, and then they use the knowledge that they gain on those projects and go and take that knowledge out and work as consultants or employees of companies. That's a good thing. I mean, that's, that's more opportunities for the students to be able to do what they want. What the institution tries to do is to avoid being overly paternalistic, so not to assume that we know what's best for the students, if we can put people in place like ombuds people and disclosure requirements so that students can make the best informed decisions that they can. So I think it's, it, nowadays, I, I'd, pr I'd say probably well over half of the conflicts of interest that I see have students involved in them in some, in some capacity. And pro well over 50% of the disclosures of technology that the university sees have students named as inventors. So, I mean, students are, they're all over the place. They're just like real people. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last this is the last case. <laughs> I 
I just want to point out here of, of uh, the, the point of what you have to tell NIH. So you do, in fact, have to tell NIH that you have a conflict, that there's a conflict, that the institution has identified a conflict of interest. But most of the time, NIH doesn't ask us anything more than that. They don't ask us uh, the personal, uh, they don't want to know about the conflict itself. They want, don't want to know how we've managed it. They just want to know that we know that there is one and that we've taken care of it. So um, it's, not, it's not scary to be involved in conflicts of interest and also try to go get federal money. We can't, uh, the agencies are, are very tuned into the fact that there's conflicts of interest all over the place now. So um, graduate students working on, on these kinds of projects, uh, even if they're doing dissertation research, the institution will attempt to protect uh, the interests of the students while they're working on these projects. And also, we, we like to have our cake and eat it too is the bottom line. We like to be able to get all the benefits, all these stuff, and also get, um, manage all the conflicts and assume that we did all the right things. So this is, we actually allowed this as well. So in case anybody wants to steal the quotes or the cases, you can do that from there. Thank you. Questions, anybody? Anyway?